matter nearly as much as the profit potential, and nothing creates debts like warfare. England was the best example at that time. During the 119-year period between the founding of the Bank of England and Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, England had been at war for 56 years, and much of the remaining time she'd been preparing for war. In World War I, the German Rothschilds loaned money to the Germans, the British Rothschilds loaned money to the British, and the French Rothschilds loaned money to the French. In America, J.P. Morgan was the sales agent for war materials to both the British and the French. In fact, six months into the war, Morgan became the largest consumer on earth, spending $10 million a day. His offices here at 23 Wall Street were mobbed by brokers and salesmen trying to cut a deal. In fact, it got so bad that the bank had to post guards at every door and at the partners' homes as well. Many other New York bankers made out as well from the war. President Wilson appointed Bernard Baruch to head the War Industries Board. According to historian James Perloff, both Baruch and the Rockefellers profited by some $200 million during the war. But profits were not the only motive. There was also revenge. The money changers never forgave the czars for their support of Lincoln during the Civil War. Also, Russia was the last major European nation to refuse to give in to the privately owned central bank scheme. Three years after World War I broke out, the Russian Revolution toppled the czar and installed the scourge of communism. Jacob Schiff of Kuhn Loeb and Company bragged from his deathbed that he had spent $20 million towards the defeat of the czar. Money was funneled from England to support the revolution as well. Why would some of the richest men in the world financially back communism, the system that was openly vowing to destroy the so-called capitalism that made them wealthy? Researcher Gary Allen explained it this way. If one understands that socialism is not a share of the wealth program, but is in reality a method to consolidate and control the wealth, then the seeming paradox of super-rich men promoting socialism becomes no paradox at all. Instead, it becomes logical, even the perfect tool of power-seeking megalomaniacs. Communism, or more accurately, socialism, is not a movement of the downtrodden masses, but of the economic elite. As W. Cleon Skousen put it in his 1970 book, The Naked Capitalist, Power from any source tends to create an appetite for additional power. It was almost inevitable that the super-rich would one day aspire to control not only their own wealth, but the wealth of the whole world. To achieve this, they were perfectly willing to feed the ambitions of the power-hungry political conspirators who were committed to the overthrow of all existing governments and the establishments of a central worldwide dictatorship. But what if these revolutionaries get out of control and try to seize power from the super-rich? After all, it was Mao Tse-Tung who in 1938 stated his position concerning power. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. The Wall Street, London Axis elected to take the risk. The master planners attempted to control revolutionary communist groups by feeding them vast quantities of money when they obeyed, and contracting their money supply or even financing their opposition if they got out of control. Lenin began to understand that although he was the absolute dictator of the new Soviet Union, he was not pulling the financial strings. Someone else was silently in control. The state does not function as we desired. The car does not obey. A man is at the wheel and seems to lead it but the car does not drive in the desired direction. It moves as another force wishes. Who is behind it? Representative Lewis T. McFadden, the chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee throughout the 1920s and into the Great Depression years of the 1930s, explained it this way. 
The course of Russian history has indeed been greatly affected by the operations of international bankers. The Soviet government has been given United States Treasury funds by the Federal Reserve Board, acting through the Chase Bank. England has drawn money from us through the Federal Reserve Banks and has relent it at high rates of interest to the Soviet government. The Dnieper Satori Dam was built with funds unlawfully taken from the United States Treasury by the corrupt and dishonest Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. In other words, the Fed and the Bank of England, at the behest of the international bankers who controlled them, were creating a monster, one which would fuel seven decades of unprecedented communist revolution, warfare, and most importantly, debt. In case you think there's some chance that the money changers got communism going and then lost control, in 1992 the Washington Times reported that Russian President Boris Yeltsin was upset that most of the incoming foreign aid was being siphoned off, quote, straight back into the coffers of Western banks in debt service, close quote. No one in his right mind would claim that a war as large as World War I had a single cause. Wars are complex things with many causative factors. But on the other hand, it would also be equally foolish to ignore as a prime cause of World War I those who would profit the most from the war. The role of the money changers is no wild conspiracy theory. They had a motive, a short-ranged self-serving motive as well as a long-range political motive of advancing totalitarian governments with the money changers maintaining the financial clout to control whatever politician might emerge as the leader. Next, we'll see what the money changers ultimate political goal is for the world. Shortly after World War I, the overall political agenda of the money changers began to be clear. Now that they controlled national economies individually, the next step was the ultimate form of consolidation, world government. The new world government proposal was given top priority at the Paris Peace Conference after World War I. It was called the League of Nations. But much to the surprise of Paul Warburg and Bernard Baruch, who attended the peace conference with President Wilson, the world was not yet ready to dissolve national boundaries. Nationalism still beats strong in the human breast. For example, Lord Curzon, the British Foreign Secretary, called the League of Nations a good joke, even though it was the stated policy of the British government to support it. To the humiliation of President Wilson, the U.S. Congress wouldn't ratify the League either despite the fact that it had been ratified by many other nations without money flowing from the u.s treasury the league died after world war one the american public had grown tired of the internationalist policies of democrat woodrow wilson in the presidential election of nineteen twenty republican warren harding won a landslide victory with over sixty percent of the vote Harding was an ardent foe of both Bolshevism and the League of Nations. His election, which opened a 12-year run of Republican presidents in the White House, led to an unprecedented era of prosperity known as the Roaring Twenties. Despite the fact that the war had brought America a debt ten times larger than its Civil War debt, still the American economy surged. Gold had poured into the country during the war, and it continued to do so afterwards. In the early 1920s, the governor of this bank, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, a man named Benjamin Strong, met frequently with the secretive and eccentric governor of the Bank of England, Montague Norman. Norman was determined to replace the gold England had lost to the U.S. during World War I and return the Bank of England to its former position of dominance in world finance. On top of that, rich with gold, the American economy might get out of control again, just like it had done after the Civil War. During the next eight years, under the presidencies of Harding and Coolidge, the huge federal debt built up during World War I was cut by 38 percent, down to 16 billion dollars, the greatest percentage drop in U.S. history. 
During the election of 1920, Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge ran against James Cox, the governor of Ohio, and the little-known Franklin D. Roosevelt, who had previously risen to no higher post than President Wilson's Assistant Secretary of the Navy. After his inauguration, Harding moved quickly to formally kill the League of Nations. Then he quickly moved to reduce domestic taxes while raising tariffs to record heights. Now this was a revenue policy of which most of the founding fathers would certainly have approved. His second year in office, Harding took ill on a train trip in the West and suddenly died. Although no autopsy was performed, the cause was said to be either pneumonia or food poisoning. When Coolidge took over, he continued Harding's domestic economic policy of high tariffs on imports while cutting income taxes. As a result, the economy grew at such a rate that net revenue still increased. Now that had to be stopped. So just as they'd done so frequently before,